We're being invaded.
You can reference that. But between the slides uh, being posted and you had to do an extra reading on the article, I feel like you guys have some good understanding or you got a good instruction on World War II at home. Sometimes I feel like that class fits a little bit better after we've already talked about the whole war. And then I can say and check out what was going on at home. But given that I had to be gone for the day, I thought it was a good class to do up front. And I'm going to reference backwards. We're talking about something today. I'm going to turn and say, and this is why that happened on the home front. So you guys have that understanding up front, and then we're able to continue talking about it more as we go. So today, this week, we are in World War II. World War II is best taught in a couple different chunks. And today we're going to talk about what is known as the Pacific Theater of World War II. And what actually draws the United States into World War II was what? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. So, for well, world historians, you've seen a class that's similar, but I'm going to be giving you a bit of a different perspective on a couple of thoughts. Uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully it is just a refresher, right? If you could be like Swanson, that was so boring because you gave that exact class last year, well, that means you remember the exact same class from last year. I'm going to bet, though, that there's a few things you've forgotten, and maybe I'm going to help you remember that along the way. So, very often... The day of the attack on Pearl Harbor is called a, a date which will live in infamy. And December 7th, 1941 is a day that shaped America into what we are today, a world-changing day. So we're all we're going to be talking all about the day that changed America, December 7th, 1941. Now you have your page in front of you. I've got it sectioned out, kind of like we got used to for vocab. Uh, things are in order, so third block was all like, have we gotten to this one yet? Have we gotten to this one yet? If you haven't seen it yet, we haven't gotten to it yet. So just slow down and slow down, okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember you touched I'll get it, man. I promise. You remember this? Yeah. Good. You've been there that way. Something cool that uh, between the last time you saw me and this time, so this past summer, which is about like eight months ago at this point, but this past summer we did go on vacation, family vacation to Hawaii, and we visited Pearl Harbor. So I visited as a college kid, and I showed you some of those pictures, but we also visited just this past summer, much more recently, and for me personally, I was able to see it with new eyes, the eyes of a teacher, the eyes of an adult, having come through my first year of teaching, and then knowing I was going to teach U.S. history, I was looking at it from a pretty specific perspective, trying to like build my knowledge, 
to teach it to you, you right here in class. So I'm going to bring that perspective to you a little bit, having just been to Pearl Harbor pretty recently. So first thing we need to define, though, right? You could define World War II with probably a million different sentences. You want to write a million sentences? Here's like the biggest upfront summary of World War II. Again, could say a whole lot of things about World War II, but this is what I want you to write. Copy all of this down inside the World War II section. The war that was fought between 1939 and 1945. If a test question should ever say something about the 1940s, it is talking about World War II. Put your brain in the right time place. Don't think about World War I. Don't think about War of 1812. If we're talking about the 1940s, we're talking about World War II. Now, U.S. involvement was not that whole time. U.S. was involved 1941 to 1945. So if we can bracket the years in our brain, we kind of know what's going on with the rest of the world. The world is at war. The war was fought between the Axis and the Allied Powers. And on your notes, I want you to write down what each of those are. I'm going to show you that here in just a second. And then just kind of that big influence statement, like why did World War II matter? Well, by the end of World War II, it had propelled America into superpower status throughout the world. I would argue that every victory so far, War of 1812, Spanish-American War, World War I, right, we've stepped a little bit closer to being a world superpower. World War II definitely confirms the United States as a world superpower. So uh, obviously people give their whole lives and whole career to being a scholar on World War II. The number of pictures and writings and posters and video, right, because it's a time period where there's video, you can spend your whole life studying World War II. It's not what we get to do in this class. We gotta go pretty quick, but maybe, just maybe, give you some curiosity, give you enough that you want to keep learning about it, give you an understanding and make you curious to keep learning about it. That's the goal of this class. So uh, here's the who, okay, like if we're thinking like a historian where I was thinking through the five W's, here's the who, here's who fought the war. The so-called bad guys in this war are known as the Axis. In World War I, they were known as the Central Powers. We got a small change here, now they're known as the Axis Powers. And Axis means kind of joint unity, something to that effect. So the Axis powers are. Now here's something that may be a little bit different than you've heard it before. I don't think we should say the name of the countries as they are the present day countries. Because we didn't go to war with Germany. We went to war with Nazi Germany. There's a difference. Germany today is our friend. I know it's a little hard to think about because Germany has done some bad things in world history. But Germany today is our friend. Nazi Germany, on the other hand, Nazi Germany was our was not our friend. Nazi Germany was our enemy. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing for Japan. Japan, the country today, is our friend and our ally. But the empire of Japan in the 1940s was our enemy. And similarly, the Kingdom of Italy. So I know that's a little bit different than maybe you've seen it written before. Maybe you've just seen the countries written out before. But Nazi Germany, Empire of Japan, Kingdom of Italy. Those are the enemies. Question? Okay, question. Is it Nazi Germany now? Well, there is no Nazi Germany anymore, hallelujah. But Germany, yeah. Germany is our friend today. Germany's our trade partner and our uh, NATO partner. Yep, Japan is our friend. They have bombed us. We have come. No, we bombed them. <coughs> they bombed us at Pearl Harbor. Yes, we bombed them with atomic bombs. So, Slade, you make a good point. There's been a lot of healing that's happened in the years since. Allied powers. These are the so-called good guys. Uh, the United Kingdom, i.e. Britain. America, that's us. Russia, or a little bit more accurately, we probably shouldn't say Russia, but we should say the Soviet Union. Sometimes it's written as Russia, but the Soviet Union. And then, what do you notice about the fourth Allied power? It's France. It's written really small. France. Why do you think it's written really small? Because it has a small part. Small part, what do you got? Borderline on and off. Small part is a good way to put it. France is actually the country that had been invaded and needed to be free. So France was on the side of the Allies, but they didn't have an army. They had been beaten down. They had been invaded. They had some resistance fighters. And the resistance fighters were definitely on the side of the Allies. But overall, small part, small influence. They're on the Allies, but they're not a powerful member of the Allies. Did I answer a question that you had earlier? Got it? Okay. So these are the teams. These are who we're talking about. A couple more pictures here. Here's the bad guys. Italy, Germany, Japan, 
Obviously, when we think Nazi Germany, we got to think Adolf Hitler, major player in world history. Here's the good guys, Britain, the United States, and Russia, or the USSR. It's really probably the best way to put that, okay? Uh, so, yep, these are all key people. I didn't say their names. That's Winston Churchill, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin. Wait a second, Joseph Stalin, isn't he that communist guy that plucked the chicken's butt and fed a little pickles of bread? Yeah. yeah. We were allies with the communists out of convenience. They were against Germany. We are against Germany. So sometimes you're brought together by a common enemy. But that very quickly departed. And we're going to talk about how we didn't stay friends with Russia for very long. All right. So during the um, World War II, right, where like American, like black African Americans were together with, were they in the military? Yeah. They were in the military. They were in no, all black members. No, so there was still segregation. Yeah, had a, like, there was still segregation. Let me stay on topic. Good question. You're a thinker, but let me stay on topic. I'm going to get to it. I promise. I'm going to get to it. All right. So I'm telling you the story. Hang with me. Your next one, it says the Lend Lease Act. Just hang with me for a second because I'm going to set it up. I'll make sure you know it's right. Neutrality. What does neutrality mean? Neutrality. Don't get involved in foreign entanglements. Take it all the way back to George Washington, who warned against foreign entanglements. He said, stay neutral, especially if the conflict is where? Overseas. On the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Why would we get involved? Hashtag not our problem. So the U.S. was very cautious about getting involved in World War II. Why? What do you think some of the whys are? So I didn't bring it to a uh, So it wouldn't come to America? Okay. What are we fresh coming off of? Very fresh. Uh, in the midst of the Great Depression, and then a step before that, Don't World War One. We got a long memory all the way back to World War One, and we're not exactly interested in getting involved in another one. If it's on the other side of the ocean, that's Europe's problem. Hashtag not our problem. Just leave it there. So that's a big reason that we didn't want to get involved is the memory of World War One. What this does lead us to do is pass a law, pass a legislation in Congress that's called the Cash and Carry Act. What Cash and Carry means is this. It's kind of like in the name of the, uh, of, of the act. If European powers needed our help, if they would come to our shores with their own boat, pay for supplies in cash, weapons, ammunition, food, oil, pay for it in cash, put it on their boats, and send their boat back across the ocean, we were willing to help them. But we were not sending our own boats over there. We were not shipping across the Atlantic Ocean. We were not taking IOUs for payment or credit for payment. If you could pay in cash and you could carry your own supplies, we're willing to help you. Very minimal involvement, right? Kind of like no skin off our nose. Very minimal <coughs> involvement. Helping the European allies a little bit, but not getting involved. Well, by and large, that wasn't super effective. They were not able to come across the Atlantic Ocean. They were cash poor and they didn't have enough cash to be paying us. It was really an ineffective measure, basically no more help, you know, than us not being involved at all. So that leads Congress to pass another act, which is known as the Land Lease Act. This is what you need to write. Go ahead and write what's in yellow. What's in yellow in particular? Like the Land Lease Act allowed us to support Sorry, European allies without putting soldiers into the fight. Right? In the Army, a lot of times that's called boots on the ground. We were able to support the allies without putting boots on the ground. What we were able to do, we basically took the cash part out of it. Now we're lending equipment, and let me try to make it a, you know, make a point for you. If you lend your cousin 50 bucks, be honest. Do you ever expect to see that money again? No. Yeah. If you lend out your car to someone, is it going to come back in the same condition that you lent it out in the first place? You're taking a risk, right? So in lending money and equipment and supplies, we kind of honestly knew that we probably weren't going to get repaid. But what it allowed us to do is help the allies who needed it, and there wasn't a financial burden to them, the pay cash part of it. This was seen as a good compromise. We're not putting soldiers into the fight. We're not getting directly involved in European affairs, but we are helping them out financially, militarily, equipment-wise uh, with the Lend-Lease Act. So this is all kind of like stepping stones. This is walking us closer to actually being involved in the war. Terry, she's had your hand up. Um, did they named the war at the present moment. Or no? They named the war at the present moment. Like World War One, did it? Did it get named? Well, what was World War One initially called? Uh, Great. Oh, 
the Great War, or even the War to oh, oh, end all wars. War to end all wars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they definitely didn't call World War One because we didn't know that there was going to be a two. So to your question, a lot of times wars don't get named right away. They get named after the fact. That's a good question. Well, sometimes it's common sense, like the Vietnam War. Was it called VO One? Huh? VO One. I feel like I'm walking into a joke there. That so move on. Uh, so if you've written that down, that's good. A little bit more. Through Lyndon Lease, by the time that the United States officially got involved in the war, based on the attack at Pearl Harbor, which we're going to talk about today, the United States had lent $50 billion of equipment, that's billion with a B, to the allied countries, Great Britain, France, Soviet Union, and China. $50 billion. So we're the good friends, right? When you lend $50 billion worth of equipment, you're the good guy, or at least you know they see you as a good friend. So check this out. When we did get attacked at Pearl Harbor, who do you think came to help us? All of them. These countries that we've been helping. So it goes to show that we had already built a friendship and an alliance even before we got involved in the war. And it paid off because when we got sucker punched, our buds, who we've been helping out, came to our aid, came to our team. So it was a positive development. Lyndon Lease was a very positive thing. It allowed a group to be built, an alliance to be built, and in a time of need, we were able to have a team already ready there for us. We helped them, they helped us. So that's kind of the big impact of the Lend Lease Act right there. I see a couple of you still writing. I'm about to tell you a little bit more about the road to Pearl Harbor. I would say each of these that we've talked about in the past couple of minutes has been a stepping stone on the road to Pearl Harbor, but just a little bit more directly, how do we get to where we're going? So the road to Pearl Harbor. So first of all, let's say this. Pearl Harbor is an island in Hawaii. Hawaii is not a state. I know today Hawaii is the 50th state. We have a 50 star flag, right, because we have 50 states. But at the time, in the 1940s, there was only 48 states. These states right here were the only states. In fact, our flag even looked differently. It was eight rows of six stars. So a 48 star flag. I wish I had one. If anyone ever has a 48 star flag, I'd buy buy it from you. Uh, so I can show my classes. But our, our flag did not look like that. And when you look at World War II photography, you don't see that flag, you see a 48 star flag. So it's notable, Hawaii was not a state, but a territory, okay? But it was an American territory. Mm-hmm. And we had a naval base there. Hawaii is located pretty smack in the middle of the ocean, and right on top of my new rule sign, right between California and Japan. Okay, smack in the middle of Pacific. When we visited, right, we took our airplane flight, water, 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 hours of water, land, right? It's a strategic location because of where it is. We've already talked about from an imperialism perspective a little bit, you want to plant your flag all over the world. Well, what was Hawaii good for? Uh, Shipping? Coconuts. I'll hear that. I'm a beach. It was a place. Uh, not that nobody knew about it so much, but it was a midway point for airplanes, for ships, for supplies, for troops. Very st- significant, very strategic. So obviously, we didn't want to give it up. It's not like we wanted to, you know, we, didn't, we certainly didn't want to lose it. The other thing about its location is that many people thought it would be impractical to attack, even the word impossible. Impossible to attack. Why? Wow. Well, how about this? Because it was in the middle of nothing. If you were going to attack Hawaii, you'd have to uh, be flying a long distance to use airplanes. Or you'd have to sail for a long distance to use ships. Obviously, any soldiers that's going to attack the uh, attack the islands, it's not like you're going to swim there. Okay, so it was in the middle of the ocean, and that would make it very hard to attack. But because of that belief, we did a very bad job of defending it. Because we believed it would be impossible to attack, we found ourselves chilling on a Sunday morning kick back, relaxing, precisely at the moment that we did get attacked. So very often, when you think something is impossible to attack in military history, it is those very attitudes that lead to that place getting attacked in the first place. Nothing is impossible. So that attitude, is a very bad attitude, ultimately led to Pearl Harbor getting attacked and destroyed in the way that it was. Question? Oh, not not one. Okay. Um, So now, um, one more little fact, and I'll do the next screen. So the uh, Japanese government, they actually did not want to do the surprise attack. The Japanese government, they wanted to declare war and then attack. 
because that's the right way to do it. I know it sounds weird, but there's rules for war. Even though we're killing people and you're like, oh, what are the rules of war? There's an international set of rules for how you conduct war. And you're supposed to declare the war before you start attacking someone. So the Japanese government, they wanted to do that. But from a military perspective, what do you think the military wanted? The ambush. They wanted surprise. the element of surprise. They ambush did. and surprise, that's right. So in the end, this debate, the military wins out. Japan does not declare a war. And that leads to them having that big moment of surprise when they attack America. We were totally caught off guard. We were not expecting it. Now, there's a lot of information about should we have expected an attack, maybe, based off of different telegraphs and whatnot. But in the end, we did not expect the attack. We were very caught off guard. So, so here it is. Here's the big definition of Pearl Harbor. So I want you to write this down under the bombing of so Pearl Harbor. So you're saying the military didn't think about it, like, the military didn't see that here. I'm going to tell you more about it. Well, we didn't know until, like, the moment of, until we were right on top of it. Right, we're not very defended for it. So nowadays, so, write this down and then I'll, I'll answer your question. Everything I say today is related to Pearl Harbor, but as for the actual definition, this is the key information. Surprise attack on the U.S. naval base in Hawaii by Japanese forces, December 7th, 1941. That's the win. And then what's the impact? Caused the United States to join World War II. December 7th, 1941, a date which shall live in infamy. Definitely a day that shaped America. Angel's kind of asking about, you know, what is the moment that they knew when they saw the planes, whatever. Could it happen again today? Today, obviously, we have a whole lot more technology. It's hard to make comparisons because we have so much new technology in the world. Today, it's hard to uh, take a step outside without the enemy knowing it or without someone watching you. So a sneak attack today in this same fashion, probably hard to think that that would be realistic. Uh, but it happened at this time because there wasn't GPS, satellites, imagery, Google Earth, like all that kind of stuff. Obviously, that's new technology. So while you're finishing up that definition, what we're going to do next, I'm going to take you through the top 10 big facts about Pearl Harbor. Some of these are kind of real big common sense facts. Some of them get into the nitty gritty just a little bit. Top 10 big facts about Pearl Harbor. And by the time I'm done, I think you're going to understand the whole attack a whole lot better. So any questions you have along the way, feel free to ask. But I also might say, hang on to that. I'm going to answer that in just a second. Question? Uh, wasn't there an uh, yeah, aircraft carrier back then? Yes, hang on. I'm going to answer that in just a second. Top 10 big facts about Pearl Harbor. So first things first, kind of already said it. Pearl Harbor is on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. This is the state of Hawaii. It's made up of five big islands. This biggest island is actually called Hawaii. The other islands have different names. So he well, the main, um, no. So here's where we're at now. In terms of your notes, there's going to be a couple questions along the way. And uh, it's not just as cut and dried as number one, write it down. Read the question, write down the answer. Now, for your first one, that's the answer, the island of Oahu. Island of Oahu. Which one? Oh, what island? Read. I believe in you. Island of Oahu. The reason I point this out is because I think, maybe if you were like me, when I was growing up, I assumed it happened on the biggest island. That's not the case. The Actually, the most populated island is this particular island right here. It's where the city of Honolulu is, which is the capital of Hawaii. The touristy island today is Oahu, right here. These other islands are a little bit more nature-preserved, whereas Honolulu is urban, and touristy. I mean, there's some nice nature pieces too, and there's some plenty of you know beautiful beaches and surfing. But Honolulu and Oahu, they're basically like the touristy island. Well, this attack at Pearl Harbor happens on this island of Oahu, and I'm just kind of giving that to you so you don't go any farther in life thinking it happened on the Big Island. It happened on the island of Oahu. Question? Um, is the are the other islands like more are they poor compared to the? Um, it's more like just native lifestyle. Uh, and I don't mean like tea huts, but I mean just like laid back, not as urbanized, not as money driven. Uh, and if you're going to go to something like Maui, you're going to experience a little bit more of nature than on Oahu. There's the apartment building, sky rises, and such like that. Just a different feel. Uh, people do island hop. They take the little puddle jumpers, you know, the little like tiny airplanes from one island to the next. But the big airliners that come from overseas land in Honolulu. Two questions. Uh, okay, so here is how, here's why Hawaii was considered to be improbable to attack or impossible to attack. 
This is Japan. This is 5,000 miles. This is Hawaii. The idea was that Japan is 5,000 miles away from Hawaii. We'll see them coming. There's no way they're going to sneak up on us. Well, look at this. This is exactly what happened. This shows over the course of a week, November 26th, November 30th, December 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, the Japanese Navy gets within 230 miles. The commanders at Pearl Harbor said, Mr. President, don't worry about it. They'll never get within 1,000 miles of us. If they get within 1,000 miles of us, we'll send out our aircraft. We'll blow them out of the water. Pearl Harbor is impossible to attack. What did the president do? After but here's what actually happened. We had our guard down. We weren't very vigilant. And the Japanese Navy got within 230 miles. So basically that it's impossible to attack thing blown right out of the water. Once you're within 230 miles, then, you, then they could fly their airplanes, which is exactly what they did. So this is how the attack kind of unfolded, kind of manifested. Pearl Harbor was bombed on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, at 7.55 in the morning. What is generally happening at 7.55 a.m. on a Sunday? Church might be a thing. Yeah, church or just chilling it. Sleeping, breakfast, off duty. The point is they were not ready to man their battle stations. They were not ready to give it back to the Japanese. So it was a big sneak attack based also on the time of day that they came in the morning. Uh, very often December 7th is called a date which will live in infamy. Kind of a synonym for famous. A day which will live in infamy. This is the phrase that President Roosevelt used to describe this day. And it actually turns into one of the most powerful phrases that comes out of uh, history. A day which will live in infamy. This is, you guys know I'm a nerd for primary sources. This is a telegraph from that day. And it says, air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is not a drill. Right? This is not a drill. That means, oh shoot guys, real life. Air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is not a drill. This is not a drill. December 7th, urgent. I just, I love the primary sources, right? The fact that someone saved this little slip of paper, and it's probably in a museum somewhere. Golfers and the track people. Golfers and the track people. That is neither of y'all. I play golf. Neither of y'all. What does that mean? What does that mean? All U.S. Navy ships. That means, like, so the action is be alert. Basically, be alert. Uh, that's that's and that's who it's sending to all U.S. Navy ships present in the Hawaiian area. Be alert! Be alert! This is the key message: air raid, no drill. Air raid, no drill. So check this out. No, check this out. Um, this is uh, this is the actual island. Okay, this is Oahu. Now remember the uh, map of Hawaii. It's a little bit smaller than the Big Island. Here's why Pearl Harbor is actually significant. I don't know about you, but I grew up thinking that Pearl Harbor was like on a beach, right, right on the edge of the beach. I did. Well, a harbor, check this out, the harbor goes inland. And the harbor is protected from the waves, the, the hurricanes, the surf. That's why a harbor is ideal for ships to come in and rest or get worked on or just a safe place where they're protected. It's because it's inland. That's what makes it significant. You can't make that out of, by, you know, man-made. You can't dig that out of the earth. You gotta find a natural harbor, that's what Pearl Harbor is. So it is significant that it's inland, and that is why the island of Oahu was so strategic. Here's how the attack actually unfolded. Two waves starting at 7.55 a.m. The first wave comes around the west side of the island, and you can see 183 aircraft, different types. Some of them were bombers, some of them were the dive bombers and the attackers with the torpedoes, different types of aircraft, mostly targeting Pearl Harbor but also targeting this airfield right here. This is an Army airfield, and this is another airfield, Hickam. So Wheeler, Hickam, and Pearl. So those are, those are the three areas of attack. Question? Uh, hang on to that, I'll answer that in a question. Okay. Or answer that in a second. So the first wave, whoa, bam, comes from the west side of the island. Those airplanes leave. The Americans may not have known it, but there's a second wave inbound. The Japanese knew it for sure. About an hour later, 59 minutes later, just as soon as they had left, there's a second wave, and it comes from the other side. So if the Americans thought, oh, they left, okay, we can start mopping up, the, the, you know, we can start cleaning up the mess. Nope, not yet, because there's a second wave. The second wave comes from the other side of the island, the east side of the island. It attacks Pearl. This is a base, Hanoi, and it also goes back to Hickam. So three big targets 
from that second wave as well. You can see slightly fewer aircraft, but it's still pretty much a, a powerful second wave. Japanese actually had a third wave planned, but the third wave got called off. You know what the third wave was supposed to attack? Do. Do you? The radar station. Not as much the base as there was some fuel storage on the island right here. And the theory is, if they had attacked that fuel storage, it was the only, it was the mega deposit of fuel in the Pacific, the Pacific Ocean. If the Japanese had destroyed that fuel, the Navy would have been crippled. They could not have refueled themselves. They could not have waged the war. But because that third attack got caught off, they did not attack the fuel cells right here. The, uh, the Navy, even though the ships got beat up, okay, the ships did get shot down pretty well, but they were able to be repaired. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They were able to be repaired, and the fact that we still have the fuel reserves was very significant, very significant. So a lot of people say, it's a God thing, whatever you choose to believe, a lot of people say it's a miracle that that third wave got called off. Now, I built this slide up a little while back. I made it as crazy as possible because I like to think that this is probably what it felt like to be on the island on that day. Airplanes buzzing everywhere, bombs going off. You know, I've, I've been on the island, I've been on Oahu, and I can say that wherever you are, it's not like you can see from one end to the other, but wherever you are on the island, and we visited pretty much the whole island, you, can, you would be able to see airplanes in the sky, right? You would be able to see what was going on. So nobody on the island that day uh, didn't know what was going on. Everybody knew that they were under attack. Um, do one more step here, and then we'll take our bathroom break, okay? This is the uh, the type of airplane that was used to do the, the dive bombing. And what does this look like? A torpedo. A torpedo. So how do you think an airplane uses a torpedo? It gets close to the water, and it drops. It gets close to the water, and it drops it. That's exactly right. Torpedo goes into the water. What does it do next? It shoots off the ship. Uh, okay, it glides in the water, and then ideally it slams into the side of the ship. But first what it does, based on gravity, is it goes deep into the harbor, and it guides back up based off its tail fin, and then it slides into the side of the ship. But traditional torpedoes would go over 60 feet down before they started their dive back up. Pearl Harbor is only 42 feet deep. Mm, problem for the Japanese, right? How are they going to use their torpedoes? I thought they were going to drop them. Just drop them straight on. That's a little bit of a different bombing strategy. Does anybody remember what I said last year, Jazz? Last year, Here's what the Japanese did. This tail fin right here, that little piece right there is a wooden apparatus that would limit how far it dove into the water. It limited it to like half as much, 20 feet or so. So the fact that this little wooden device was affixed onto the torpedo, it shows how much the Japanese planned for the attack. Some people try to say, oh, they just attacked because it was convenient. They didn't really plan it. It just happened. That's not the case. Most evidence points towards, especially something like that, they practiced the attack, they planned the attack, they were well ready for the attack, they rehearsed the attack, and this fin, this tail fin right there, proves the fact that they had to practice and they had to experiment in order to get the torpedoes just right. So, interesting little side fact right there. We'll pause right there, we'll take a bathroom break, come on back, I got some more for you. Yo, what's up, YouTube? Go streaming. Walk it out. Get the chair, bro. Ooh, you're still in. Imagine. At least I can walk on mine.
Nobody. Push it. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's cold in here. That's nasty. <laughs> Did you come back up? All right. I heard an angel invite someone to come and watch the bombing of Pearl Harbor. That means you guys like this class, right? Yeah, man. Right? Right, right. All right. Here we go. So, following, following the actual attack on Pearl Harbor on that day, the United States declares war against Japan. And that means we are now officially, Terry, come right there. That's it. Come right there. That means we are now officially involved in World War II. I'll do the next. I will. Right? Zero chance. So, boom. That means we are now officially involved in World War II. Now, what does it take to declare war? Can the president just say we're at war? Someone has to, you know, like, who, who's the someone? Who votes on it? Who votes to go to war? Congress. The Congress. 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 That's right. So Congress unanimously, I take that back, all but one, voted to go to war. Uh, and that puts us at war with, with uh, uh, Japan. This is Congress uh, preparing to hear a speech from Franklin Roosevelt. And here is Franklin Roosevelt, the president, delivering his very famous speech on the evening of December 7th, 1941. And it is in this speech where he gives the very famous remarks, uh, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Now, here's a little side extra. I like to nerd out on this kind of stuff. Maybe you will as well. You know. This is the initial remarks to his speech. So you see, proposed message. You've got a lot of scratch outs. Why do you think there's a lot of scratch outs? Because it changed during the time. Changes, yeah. Uh, like when you edit an essay, you got your first draft. And you scratch, try to make it a little bit better. That's right. So this first draft, it didn't mean it was a bad speech. It just meant they're trying to make it better. Well, check this out. Here's the very first line, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in, it initially says, world history. But he scratches it out, and with his own handwriting, he writes the word infamy. Which do you think was a more powerful way to say it? World history. history. A date which will live in world history? No, because that's infamy. Or a day which will live in infamy. Yeah, I, I think like, he, I feel like his speechwriter probably wrote this first draft, and then he scratches it out, and he gives it this more powerful word. And I just, I've always been fascinated by that, that he made some changes, and then, of course, the way that he changed the language lives in history. Now, check this out. When we went to Hawaii this summer, right, you can tour the base, you can see where the, the ships have been sunk, all that kind of stuff. Then there's a couple little side museums as well. Artifacts, couple, just a couple things that help tell the story. So I'm walking around this museum, just browsing the artifacts. I love a good museum. When all of a sudden I turn the corner you see that? and face to face in front of me is Franklin Roosevelt's original speech. And I tell you guys, I got chill bumps because I realized I was looking. I know, maybe I'm dirtier than you. I realized I was looking at Franklin Roosevelt's original handwriting. That man sat down with this paper. He scratched out world history, and he wrote the word infamy. Did so of course, of course, I took a picture with it, and there it is, right there. What was your question about his handwriting? Well, that's his handwriting, right? So it's just kind of a, you know, just kind of scratchy handwriting. Yeah. Anyway, what I hope I give to you, as I show you all the travels I've had before in, in my life and all the things I've seen, I hope that I give to you a love of learning, 
I hope I encourage you to go to museums and try to see some of these things for yourself as well. And then also, I know not everybody has had a chance to get on an airplane and go to Hawaii, such like that, but you can make choices in your life to travel. You should. You don't have to stay here. You don't have to live here. You don't have to die here. You can make lifestyle choices, yeah, right? You, you save your money, you make you a plan, money? you get on the airplane, and you go. So what I hope I give to you is not the Swanson World Travels, you know, slideshow. You should bring but I hope I encourage you to try to think big and take vacations and take travels for yourself as well. So anyway, that's the side after this. All right, moving on. Here, this is uh, this is on your notes. The may, uh, the weapons they used. Airplanes get a lot of credit for being a part of the attack, but they also use submarines. So airplanes were the main part of the attack, but the Japanese also used mini subs. They're actually nicknamed midget subs. They're not as, <laughs> yeah, they're not as large as your regular submarine. They were only made for two people. It was a super cramped type of navigation. That, big old thing right that right? is, that's a miniature submarine. So I'm going to give you one more picture here. One of these mini subs washed up on shore and uh, it's actually in a museum today. So that's you can kind of see, kind of see, oh yeah, it is small. Look, this is in a museum. I know what small If I was small. standing next to that sub, it'd probably be like right about here, right? It is a mm -hmm. miniature submarine. Two people stayed inside this submarine. They navigated. Their goal was to get inside the harbor and try to torpedo the ships even before the airplanes. Unsuccessful, okay, they had a hard time navigating. Uh, and actually, one of them even got spotted before the attack. It almost blew the attack because it got spotted before the airplanes started coming in. So submarines don't get as much credit as the airplanes, but they were part spotted. of the attack. Just imagine that, if that they got spotted by a Navy possible. patrol uh, early in the morning, about 6 a.m. This Navy patrol saw the submarine, and they actually radioed all the way back. They radioed back to their base. And the base actually kind of dropped the ball because they did not report that information to the rest of, to the, rest of the island. So maybe we could have had at least one hour's worth of a warning before the airplanes came, but uh, the commanders, they kind of dropped the ball on that. They didn't give the warning. So I didn't realize they, didn't realize it was it was the they, they maybe didn't realize how significant it was, and they didn't realize that the enemy was that close. Uh, and yeah, they kind of dropped the ball. They kind of dropped the ball overall. That was somewhere All right, this is also on your notes. The main target was the U.S. battleships. Brandon brought up a good point while we were in the restroom. Uh, there were several ships that were supposed to be at Pearl Harbor that were actually out to sea. Several aircraft carriers, those are the biggest ships, where you can land an airplane on them. If those ships had been at Pearl Harbor and had been bombed and had been destroyed, we may have had a much bigger problem coming out of Pearl Harbor. Yeah, we would have lost more equipment, more people, all that kind of stuff. So the fact that some of these ships were not in the harbor, but they were out doing maneuvers in the ocean, that's actually a positive thing, kind of saved the attack from being even bigger. But the attacks that were ship, uh, the, the ships that were attacked were located on what was known as Battleship Row, and they were basically parked right next to each other, side by side. And that made them to be an easy target. So where are my hunters at? Where are my bird hunters at? You got a flock of, something. You got a flock of ducks that's all right next to each other. One shot might get several kills, right? So that's kind of what happened here, right? They were ducks in a row. They were all lined up. I got a couple. Actually, here, let me show you a picture. This is the harbor. This is the overview of the harbor. And this is where most of the damage happened. You see those battleships? They're just all lined up ducks in a row. If they had been spread out more, maybe the damage would have been less because it would have been harder to attack. But since they were all lined up right next to each other, made them for be very easy targets. Here's another picture. Kind of just shows it with better imagery. Here's how the ships were lined up on that day. So if you're a pilot, you're coming over the coming over the hills of Hawaii, and you see eight ships parked together, <laughs> makes it for a pretty easy target. Kind of like or, or, so or that's why the damage like was so great on that day. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Uh, okay. Number six. USS Arizona was the worst sunk. This is not on your notes. USS Arizona was the worst sunk and the worst hit. USS Arizona is what's still at the bottom of the harbor today. It is actually considered a national cemetery because there's so many people still inside of the ship. They are buried at sea with the ship. They're just unable to recover them, unable to cut into the ship and rescue the bodies. So the USS Arizona sunk to the bottom of the harbor and is still there to this day. 
Here's a picture of the Arizona. This is the Arizona's mast. It's just misting. And obviously there's a lot of chaos in that picture. There's fire. You see people. I think the uh, very poignant that the flag is right there. But uh, that's a uh, that's just a picture. That's primary source picture from the ground on that day. Tal and then down. Um, didn't you say that the, um, that was like basically a graveyard in the bottom of the parade? Yeah, yeah, that's um, right. The National Cemetery. Um, doesn't like some military men offer to put their bodies in there as a graveyard? Yes. So, Talon brings up something uh, a little bit extra. Uh, and I, uh, I've made a video. We're going to catch right at the end of this class. I made a video when I was in Hawaii. Some people who survived that day, sailors who were on the Arizona but survived that day, uh, they live their life, right? They get, they're in their 70s, 80s, or 90s. When they pass away, they choose to have their body cremated, put into an urn, and then a scuba diver will take that urn back to the USS Arizona. That's cool. And they will rest with their fallen shipmates. There's about 70 people, 70 urns that have done that. So that's exactly right. Daddy? So I was looking at that one ago, and it says that they are now placed in Corvette number four. Okay. Can you kind of explain what that is? Uh, yes. Yes, I will. When we get to the model of the ship, I'll, I'll, I'll point okay. that out. So that's an actual photo someone took on yes. that day? Yep, that's right. It was probably not taken in color. Probably black and white photograph, but colorized with uh, digital techniques today. That's cool. Yep, it is pretty cool. Uh, USS Oklahoma. So me being from Oklahoma, uh, the fact that the USS Oklahoma was at Pearl Harbor, that's kind of a big part of Oklahoma history and story. Uh, and because of that, I know a little bit about the USS Oklahoma. I'll actually point out, so the shirt I'm wearing, I got at Pearl Harbor when we were there visiting. And on my shirt are the various ships that sunk on that day. And are just a couple of, it's a Hawaiian shirt, right? And then I'm also wearing, this is a Navy style hat. The only time you'll catch me wearing Navy paraphernalia. But uh, sailors on ships, when they're wearing their utility uniform, not their fancy uniform, not the dress uniform, but the utility uniform. A lot of times they wear a blue hat like this with the yellow lettering just like that, and it says the name of their ship. So this is a souvenir type item, it's not a real Navy hat, but USS Arizona, and it's got a picture of the ship, kind of looks like a Navy hat, maybe similar to what would have been worn by sailors at that time uh, as well. So these are kind of two souvenir items that I like to wear whenever I teach this class. USS Oklahoma, it was hit and was sunk as well. It actually flipped upside down. It got hit by nine different torpedoes, and it flipped upside down. So this is this is a couple days afterwards. They're cleaning up the aftermath. But this is the USS Oklahoma, totally upside down. You see the propeller. Obviously, this is the bottom of the boat. Many men were trapped inside the Oklahoma. They could actually hear them banging for several days, but they were unable to get they were unable to get to them and rescue them. And then those men per perished. You know, we don't know exactly what happened, but those men perished inside of the ship. Here's a bit of an infographic, shows you what happened to the Oklahoma. It was hit first at 7.56 a.m. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. God. It's on the bottom of the ocean at 8.08. Guys, that's 12 minutes. It went from upright, no problem, to upside down and underwater in 12 minutes. So a lot of people got trapped, got stuck, died survived. inside. There were people that survived. But there are a lot of people that died as well. 406 total uh, who died. 406 oh, total that's who died. That's missing. Inside 22 of dead. Well, when it's listed then, as missing, today is considered dead. Right. Mm -hmm. Missing at the time, but today is considered dead. So over 400 people dead inside of the USS Oklahoma. How many days? Like, were stuck in there? Uh, well, I think the story is that they were banging for about 48, 60 hours. But, you know, and then they ran out of water and died. Yep. This is, well, they didn't have any more fresh water and they died. You die, you die after about three days of no fresh water. Yep, yep. That's how it works, Devin. That's how the body works. Um, did he say they were around water? Did he say they were around water? No, he said. One more story of one more ship. I know I'm telling you the story of the ships that sunk. The USS West Virginia was also blasted and sunk to the bottom of the ocean. This is an amazing photograph. Uh, and looking at this photograph, who do you think took this photograph? An airplane. An airplane. So who took this photograph? A Japanese, a Japanese uh, pilot. That's right. A Japanese pilot snapped this photograph during the attack. This is the island. This is the harbor. Here's Battleship Row. Okay, so just like...
This is one of the few photographs from that day, That's cool. and definitely one of the only photographs that comes from that bird's eye view. So this is Battleship this Road. This is where most of the damage happened. This flashing right there, that's the moment that a torpedo is striking. Actually, the moment that it struck the USS West Virginia. You can also see a couple other planes in the sky as well. So this really? photograph tears me up. It makes me feel like I'm there whenever I look at it. That was like the first one. Yeah, Angel. I wonder how, like today, how Japanese people react to this. That's a great question. So he said, what do the Japanese people feel about this story? It's an amazing, it's amazing to think about how this story is told in Japan. And furthermore, we're not there yet, but we'll talk about the atomic bombs yeah, being maybe. dropped on Japan. Here's what I can give to you. 75 years later, there's been a lot of healing. Okay, We may have used to have been enemies, America versus Japan. But 75 years later, there's been a lot of healing and a lot of things that bring us to now friendship. So it's kind of improbable to think about. We used to be killing each other off the face of the earth. But today we're friends, and I'd say that's kind of a small miracle that that happened. USS West Virginia. It got bombed. It got attacked. Here's a crate. It's, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, so let me point it out. This is a ship that's upright, right? You can see that its mass is all the way up. Well, this right here at water level is the USS West Virginia. It just sunk straight down. So this is actually where you were supposed to be standing on the deck, and you can see it's at, it's a, you know it's command tower right there. It's at water level. It just sunk straight into the ground. What's cool about the USS West Virginia, I'm actually going to tell you two stories. One, during the attack, this young fella right here, his name is Dory Miller. I sure know on the movie. Dory Miller is a cook. Yeah, but what did, what did Dory Miller do during the attack? He killed some of the, like, the planes and stuff. That's exactly right. Slave, yeah. what movie are you talking about? That's yes. right. That, that one right there? Yeah. 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 So this is a movie that's not real life, but this in the movie... It shows Dory Miller, and here he is in real life. Dory Miller went to the guns and started shooting down Japanese airplanes. Right, right. He's credited with at least two, but maybe up to six. You know, it's kind of hard to know. At least two airplane kills on that day. But what's crazy about it is that he was a cook. Was the cook supposed to be on the guns? No. Did the cook even know how to shoot the guns? No. Yeah, he had never been trained on the guns. Why was he on the guns? Because no one else was. Because yeah. no one else was. Because his buddies needed him. Right? So it goes to show you that heroes rise to the occasion. Even though it wasn't his job, even though he wasn't trained to do it, Dory Miller rose to the occasion and he helped out his ship in a time of need. So for that, he was awarded, I think it's the second highest uh, award for valor. A lot of people believe that he should be upgraded to the Medal of Honor, and I'm one of those. I think he should be upgraded to the Medal of Honor. Dory Miller kind of has a sad story. In a different battle, not a Pearl Harbor, but in a different battle in the year 1943, he dies. So he does not survive the war uh, to kind of live his life after the war. So he survived Pearl Harbor. He survived Pearl Harbor, yes, but he did not survive after the war. He did not survive the whole war. He died in 1943. What did he become after that? Well, he, the, the country was at war. He, he, yeah, he, he continued doing his job. I think oh. he stayed a cook. I think he stayed a cook. I don't know. That's a fair question. But I do think he stayed in his original position. And uh, uh, he just he had to continue fighting the war. I don't know which battle he died in, but it was in 1943. <laughs> now think about it. What does Dory Miller look like? What man. is Dory Miller? A black man. He's a black man. He's an African-American man. man. So at home, the story of Dory Miller got used to advance... Black civil rights got used to advance the story of African American heroics, and uh, it was a positive step in kind of uh, you know starting to gain equality. Because it's like, look at this. This man doesn't matter what his skin color is; he's a hero. We should all have equality. So as part of the future of civil rights movements, does that make sense? So there's Dory Miller. There it is in the movie. Now here's a cool thing about the USS West Virginia. It was sunk at Pearl Harbor. Here's a really good picture of it. You see how it's kind of at the water level? This is a ship like it's supposed to be, but this is the USS West Virginia. That's its bow at water level. You get it? It's like sunk into the ground. Well, check this out. The ship was raised back to the surface. I don't know. Hey, what's going on? That's what I thought. The ship was raised back to the surface. It got put into action. It fought the war. And when the Japan surrendered to the United States... It was present at the surrender. So it's almost like a big screw you to Japan. You sunk our ship, but guess what? We raised our ship, 
And now when you're surrendering to us, our ship is right here to watch. Oh, this, like this is what it looked like when it got raised back to the water level. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it got sunk. That ship got sunk. Oh, and then it got raised back to life. Pretty crazy, huh? Like a baptism. There's a movie of um it just shows that. No, there's another way. There's a movie called Pearl Harbor. No, the other there's, there's a movie called Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I said there's not a movie. You said about the Yep. No, no, We're going to try to watch a couple clips of Pearl Harbor if we get done in time. Angel, what's your question? All right, bro, moving on. All right, so total death toll. This is on your questions. Total death toll, 2,350. And it's actually really hard to kind of calculate that. I've looked up different numbers. Sometimes it's a little higher than that. Sometimes it's a little higher than that because someone may have gotten injuries at Pearl Harbor, but then they died six months later, a year later, or whatever. But generally speaking, the death toll, 2,350, 1,177 of those deaths came from the USS Arizona. So when the Arizona sunk and a lot of men were inside of the Arizona and drowned, that's the largest number of people that died at Pearl Harbor was from the USS Arizona. The picture you're looking at there comes from the USS Arizona Memorial. And it's actually, it's a very beautiful wall of names, 1,177 names. Most of them from the Navy, some of them Marines, a very few of them from the Army, uh, but all their names are on this wall. And it's a, it's a very quiet place for reverence, for reflection, for thinking about what happened. People take pictures, but they're not, exa you know, people aren't very loud. People aren't very talkative. They're just kind of sitting and thinking about the men, these lives. And I know that, uh, you know, each name doesn't take up all that much space, but think about it. Every one of those lines is a person. A story, a husband, a brother, a cousin, a life cut short. So to kind of sit and look at this wall, look at this wall is a really reverent moment, and it kind of catches me, the, catches me in the feels when I'm there. There's that one man. Well, he, Gordon Miller, he didn't die. He didn't die at Pearl Harbor. He died later in the war. Later in the war. All right, moving on to the last one, and this is your last little nugget there. On the same day, the Empire of Japan also attacked the islands of Midway, Wake Island, Guam, Philippines, Malaya, and Thailand. So your notes say, was this an isolated attack? Yes. Was Pearl Harbor an isolated attack? What's isolated mean? By, by no. Was it by itself? No. Was no. it an isolated attack? No. no. Answer is no. Pearl Harbor is the story we tell ourselves because it most directly affected America. But the Japanese attacked these seven places at the same time. That's crazy. That's it was, it was crazy. a wide attack. I thought it was, it was a big Harbor. attack happening at the same time. I, for a long time, I didn't know this fact, right? I thought the story was just Pearl Harbor. Well, then, but on the same day, at the same time, the Empire of Japan did multiple attacks. So it was not just one attack. It was not just Pearl Harbor. Japan was trying to spread out. Japan was trying to dominate the Pacific region. And that's why they attacked all these islands at the same time. So then how come we only learn Pearl Harbor? Well, so how come we only learn about Pearl Harbor? Well, that's precisely why I'm telling you about this, right? I'm trying to tell you the, the whole story. Uh, like Pearl, Harbor Pearl Harbor is what most directly affected America, oh, so most right. directly affected the American Navy. Uh, but think about it. The Philippines is a territory. <laughs> Guam is a territory of, of America. Midway had American troops on it. It just wasn't as big of an attack. So yeah, you're right. We should tell the whole story, not just the story of, uh, of just Pearl Harbor. I agree. So in terms of your notes, you should write it was not an isolated attack because there were more than one island. You know, there were many islands attacked at the same time, something like that. Now flip it over to the back. Got three more little chunks, and uh, we'll see how much time we have left over. So this is kind of Pearl Harbor in a snapshot. It's what it's it's what's at the bottom of your notes. So I just printed that off for you so you can have it. Uh, and then because of all this, we now call December 7th of every year Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. So every now and then when I teach this class in first semester, and we actually have December, right? We have class on December 7th. We'll talk about Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. But I'll encourage you, even though it's March right now, when it gets around to December, try to think about Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day uh, since we've had this class. All right. So all of this, now that America's involved in the war. We're involved in what is known as, Brandon, we're involved in what's known as the Pacific Theater. And when I say theater, I don't mean movie theater, right? You go to the Alma Bacon County Movie Theater, you're going to see a movie. That's not what this word theater means. 
theater means area of operations. So kind of for the current world, we had the theater of Afghanistan and the theater of Iraq. Those were two different areas of fighting. We call them theaters. So in World War II, we have the Pacific Theater, which is what's on your page right now. And tomorrow, we're going to talk about the European theater, fighting in Europe, fighting in the Pacific. Very different type of fighting. So right now, what we're talking about is the Pacific theater. I think it's pretty obvious. I think the name itself kind of tells you where it is. It's in the Pacific Ocean area, fighting against Japan, fighting in Asia, in and around these islands. This is what characterizes the Pacific theater. The strategy in the Pacific theater was known as island hopping. And what that means is I want to take this island. As I've, I've taken this island, I bring in my planes, I bring in my ships, I bring in my supplies, I bring in my marines. Then I'm ready to go attack the next island. When I attack that island and I, and I seize it, That's I take in my planes, man. I take in my ships, I take in my marines, I take in my supplies, and then I go attack the next island. Plane, ship, marine, supplies. See what I'm doing? I'm hopping from island to island. And where do I eventually want to end up? Carl Hart. Nope. Where? Mainland Japan. Why? They were hopping all the way as far as they could, closer and closer and closer yeah. to mainland Japan yeah. to attack mainland Japan if necessary. He's already had this class. He passed. He passed. Don't worry about him. Who was it? David. Danny David. David. So island hopping, I think it kind of descriptive is you're hopping one island at a time, trying to get close to mainland Japan where we could assault if necessary. We had to be close enough that our planes and our ships could make it. We couldn't go thousands of miles across the open ocean. So that's why we had to do the island hopping campaigns. And that is a characteristic of uh, the, the Pacific Theater. Those of you that watch TV, this is a 10-part miniseries called The Pacific. It is about the fighting in the Pacific Theater. So a lot of times, and maybe it helps you remember it, the Pacific Theater is about fighting in Japan. The other side is this popular miniseries known as Band of Brothers. This is about the European Theater. Very different style of fighting in Europe, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. So two theaters. Two different styles of fighting, two different enemies. Pacific, Japan. Pacific, Japan. That's the association you have to make. Real quick, I'm going to go over two other battles that happen in the Pacific Theater, and then we'll be done, and I'm going to show you a video clip. So the Battle of Midway Island. You can see here it is midway between Japan and Hawaii. That's why it's got its name, Midway Island. Midway between Japan and Hawaii. Well, at Midway, there is an American base, okay? Not as big as Hawaii, not as big as Pearl Harbor, but there's an American base. Pearl Harbor kind of punched us in the gut, right? Ooh, we had to take a knee. We had to get healthy again. We had to fix some of our ships, our people who died. We had to get replacements out there for them. So we got sucker punched. It took our breath out for a little bit. But you can see here, by June of 1942, December of 41, now go to June of 42, about six months later, we're ready to fight. We're ready to take the fight back to the Japanese. So long story short, what happens at the Battle of Midway is that the Japanese are steaming in from Japan. Well, the Americans, we actually intercept a couple of telegraph messages, helps us know where they're going to be. And we send our full Navy, our whole Pacific fleet, to meet them at the Battle of Midway. Here's what I want you to write down for the Battle of Midway. June 4th to 7th, 1942, so a three-day battle. This becomes the turning point in the Pacific Theater. We've talked about turning points in all of our wars so far, Revolution, Civil War, etc. Well, this is the turning point of the Pacific Theater. What happens is that we, this time, America, gets to do the surprise. We surprise the Japanese naval fleet, and we attack them over the course of these three days. And we begin to take back some of these Japanese-occupied islands. All the places where Japan had a strong presence, we start the, the whole island-hopping campaign. Notably, during the Battle of Midway, we're able to sink a couple of Japanese ships. And it's actually a couple of specific Japanese ships. 
At Pearl Harbor, there were four Japanese aircraft carriers that participated in the assault. Four aircraft carriers where all these airplanes were launched off of. Well, at the Battle of Midway, there were four aircraft carriers. They're the exact same aircraft carriers, Japanese aircraft carriers. They came to the battle thinking that they were going to shoot down some more Americans. They left the battle. Actually, I take that back. They didn't leave the battle. They got sunk at Midway. All four mm. Japanese aircraft carriers are at the bottom of the ocean from the Battle of Midway. They're still down there to this day? They are still down there to this day. So out. it's kind of because it's that far down. Them. Like when a shipwreck, you can get a ship out of a 40-foot harbor. You can't get a ship out of a 1,000-yard you know, stretch to the bottom of the ocean. So it was basically a direct revenge, right? They came and bombed us at Pearl Harbor. They participated in that attack. Well, guess what? Now we have bombed them and we sunk them to the bottom of the ocean. So that's also a big crippling blow to Japan. You can lose one ship or two ships, right? You can lose some airplanes. But to lose four aircraft carriers, that really cuts Japan off at the knees. And that's why Midway is a turning point. So some of y'all still writing that down? Devin, what's your question? Uh, that's kind of insane. I don't have that answer. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter though. It's just a name. I bet Eddie's gonna look it up. No, I like. It. I thought it's probably a Hawaiian name. Honestly, it's probably related to uh, Hawaiian folklore. Yeah, Jasmine. You know, you get you get pearls out of the harbor. Why is it called harbor? Like it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Exactly. It doesn't matter. All right. Here's some photography. Actually, David, it's not photography. It's a painting of the Battle of Midway, and you can see that it is a sea and air battle. Okay. The fighting at Midway with ships and airplanes. So just think about it. Three days of bombs and missiles and battleships and torpedoes all around. So pretty significant fighting that happened at Midway. And these words right there are everything that I've already said. All right, one more to talk about. Battle of Guadalcanal. I'll take that back. Two more to talk about. You're probably done with your notes. To be honest, okay? You're good with your notes? Yes. Just listen to me for a second. Battle of Guadalcanal really highlights the island hopping campaign. Guadalcanal was a fierce fight, very bloody, 24,000 dead over the course of these uh, five months, okay? Also goes to show that it wasn't just like a one-day battle, a one-week battle. It was a five-month-long battle to try to gain control of this island. Literally, we fought for every inch, blood and guts, every single inch, trying to take back this, this, uh, take this uh, uh, island from the Japanese. Now, something else about the Japanese, and I think Jasmine kind of brought it up, uh, their national attitude of no surrender. The Japanese thought it was shameful to surrender. If you surrendered and you became a prisoner, you were shamed, and guess who was also shamed? Back home. Your family was shamed back home. They used to kill so a lot of these soldiers, that's exactly right there, but a lot of these soldiers, they would not surrender. Even if they were injured, even if they were starving, even if they were out of water, out of ammunition, whatever, they would fight to the end. So the Marines who were, who were doing this island hopping campaign, they could never just round up hundreds of prisoners. They had to fight every single Japanese soldier to the very end. And Devin also brings up a good point. A lot of times they would suicide themselves versus be captured. So. We don't understand that in America. That's not our attitude. That's not our national attitude. But in Japan, it was dishonor if you if you were captured or if you went to prison because you surrendered. So Guadalcanal, super bloody fighting. One more campaign here to tell you about, the Battle of Iwo Jima. And then we can kind of also roll into that Okinawa. This right here, now this is all, I mean, when you say, what are they named? Those are Japanese type names. This is the island of Iwo Jima. What is really notable about the island of the hill. the hill is exactly right. Long, open stretches, but the key to Iwo Jima was this hill right here. If you were the army that could put guns and artillery on the top of the hill, you were the army that was in control of the island. Well, initially that was the Japanese. Over a long time, let's see, what is this? Uh, February to June of 1945. So again, several months, bloody fighting, brutal fighting, to try to take back the island of Iwo Jima. But we did, we the Americans, we did take the, the island of Iwo Jima. And from the Battle of Iwo Jima, we get this very, very, very famous photograph. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? No. Well, what, uh, oh. 
oh, this yeah. photograph of the Marines planting the flag oh, right there. Planting the flag on this island of Iwo Jima. That's where this picture comes from. That's where this picture comes from right there. That's so cool. this kind of rounds out our class about the Pacific Theater. Do, what are your questions right now? Who has the questions? Right uh, so the question uh, belongs back to the Japanese government, but it's a different Japanese government. It's not the, why are you already here? There are 20 more minutes of class. I mean, welcome. Welcome, Sayla. Glad to see you here. Hey, actually, just in time, here's what we're going to do for our next few minutes, just in time to tell about... Yeah, go get it. Go get it. This will be good. I swear I'm not Hey, slap her. Slap her. Really, Angela? Nothing? <laughs> All right. Hey, Sayla, do you want to tell everybody about where you went this summer? Do you know what we're talking about right now? Where's that? Hawaii. Hawaii. So, good, good timing for Sailor to be here. I'm going to tell you briefly about my personal experiences at, at Pearl Harbor. This is the Swanson family trip from this summer. Sailor, it was a long time ago? Kind of a long time ago. So, right behind, right there, that's the USS Arizona. And then this is actually a floating museum. It's called the USS, like USS Missouri. <laughs> cutting off your neck. That's weird. Obviously, I'm rocking the BC. No, Daddy, because you were doing this. Oh, because I was doing that? I got you. All right. So, briefly here. I've been able to go to Pearl Harbor twice. I went in 2008 as a college kid. And then we went, yeah, that's me in 2008. And then, of course, we went this past summer as a boy. So, that's the USS Arizona Memorial. This is what it actually looks like. This is the ship that is sunk. Okay, in the ship, it goes on for a long way. Now, hey, pay attention to me. Even though your notes are done, pay attention. This is what's what the actual memorial is. That wall of names, that 1,177 names, it's right about here on the inside. How you actually get to this is you have to take a little ship out there. Take this little boat out there. You get off on the dock. You go inside. Wait, 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 just reflect wait, wait, wait. for a little bit. All right, hang on. Jasmine had a hand up first. It's clear on Yes. So Jasmine, what's something you notice? So do you see the dis do you see the discoloration right here? Yeah. This is actually oil that to this day still bubbles to the surface. The USS Terry, put your phone up. Terry, go back where I put you. Thanks. USS Arizona, it was sunk with one million gallons of fuel in it. And to this day, it bubbles to the top of the surface about two quarts of oil per day. It is called the Tears of the Arizona, as if the ship is crying for its lost shipmates. So you can see, sometimes if the color catches it just right, I hit them. If the color catches it just right, you can see how the oil slick uh, carries still carries that oil out to sea. Devin. Why does it look like a ship? Well, this oh, is think about it. That was the ship. I was going to say, this is, is the ship. Yeah, it's a, so Brent, step back one. This is the ship. Some of it's out of the water, and you can see it. Thanks. Some of it's out of the water, and you can see it. But most of it, can you see that coloration there? Most of it's just underneath the surface. Um, this is some of the oil. Okay, the oil slick that comes up every now and then. Uh, What's that? Peaceful no, you can't. So one, it's a national cemetery, right? It is considered oh. federal property. It's a national cemetery. You can't scuba. It. You can scuba dive on a lot of shipwrecks, but not this one. This is what it actually looks like underneath the surface. So imagine what I just showed you. This is the memorial. This is kind of like the water level. This is what's underneath the surface. That now, to Mr. Taylor's question, here's where they bury the urns, those 70 or so urns that have gone to be buried with their shipmates. The scuba diver takes it right about here, if I remember correctly. Basically, about 20 feet underneath the water. So he got a scuba tank on, and he just gently rests it right there with the 70 others. So it's not going to be beat around by the waves or anything like that. Right about there, it just gently rests for uh, you know for the rest of the time. That's where they place the urns. You remember that? You ate some of that? Okay. Uh, again, that's what it looks like, looks like, looks like. USS Oklahoma also has a very nice memorial. For the 406 people who died, there's a marble pillar uh, for every single one of them. And I did find, see how it, it's a really nice place to just kind of sit and think about what happened on that day. 
no relation as far as I know, but I did find a Swanson who died on the USS Oklahoma. So Oklahoma, Swanson. Yeah, I was 20 years old there, so it was a while ago. It was a while ago. Uh, and then now, Sailor, you'll like this. I made a quick video while we were at Pearl Harbor, and we're going to watch it right now. <laughs> There's Mr. Swanson here coming to you from Pearl Harbor, the island of Oahu in Hawaii. If you're watching this video, it means you must be in one of my classes, either U.S. history or world history, and I bet we have had a lesson about Pearl Harbor or the United States entering World War II or just World War II in general. So since we just talked about many of these things in class, uh, and I'm right here at Pearl Harbor where the war started for the United States on December 7, 1941, I'm going to try to bring alive to you some of the things that we just talked about in class. So come on a tour with me and uh, let's look at Pearl Harbor. You feel like you're there? Yeah, I'll take you with it. That's fine. So you can see Hawaii is urbanized, there's bridges, there's sky rises. It's still a very happening place. That's where all the battleships were parked. Each of those white pieces of concrete is where a battleship was. You can see how close together they all were. Yeah, so it's actually still an active Navy base. People live on that island, people work in the harbor. The tourist side of it is just a small part of Pearl Harbor. It's still a regular Navy base. Crazy. So you can see the memorials above the water, the battleship is below the water. That's the USS Missouri. That's where the Japanese surrendered to America. It was not at Pearl Harbor, but it is now there as a museum. You get walked it all night? Or just a little bit? Huh? You get walked in a whole show? Uh, the video is just going to take you through the memorial. We didn't get to do that. Well, you hear it. Contemplation, reflection, and reverence. So that's one of the small portions that's still above the water. That's where a main battle gun would have been. So can you see the color changing when the oil comes up to the top? Try 
to keep that a secret wherever I go. So that's a real anchor from the uh, USS Arizona. And you can see the picture of the boat there. You see the anchors kind of right on the bow over there. That's a real anchor that was uh, uh, rescued. That is a submarine. You guys have asked how big our submarine. So that's a real submarine. It's also a museum. We didn't go inside of that one. There is the FDR paper. And like I said, it gave me chill bumps to think about how he wrote on the paper with his own handwriting. A day which will live in world history. Doesn't quite sound the same. This ain't gonna be you. Hey. So a bit of a model. If you're visual like me, maybe this helps you understand it a little bit more. What a beauty. That's actually really long. And you can see those white concretes. That's where other ships were. So that's how close they were to each other. That overall really cool experience. Uh, and then you have the Hawaii and Oahu. Absolutely absolutely come to Pearl Harbor. Uh, it's more than just an active naval base. There is the memorial to the USS Arizona. There's the USS Missouri behind me. The USS Bowfin. It's a submarine. And then there's also memorials for the USS Oklahoma, USS Nevada. Uh, and several others. For anyone interested in history, love of history, if today's classes have uh, intrigued you at all, uh, I'd encourage you to read more, watch more, and maybe plan a trip back here so you yourself can walk on history. Mr. Swanson, I'm Bill Harbor. Catch you next time. Yes, I gave a class to my family before we went on the tour. And actually, Sayla took the pointer away from me and started giving the class more. <laughs> All right, so again, I hope that I encourage you to want to go to museums, to want to travel, and uh, hope I hope I made you feel like you went to Pearl Harbor. Uh, hey, hear me on this. Mr. Eddie, final fact of the day, anything? Uh, the bees got to yeah. 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 Okay, um, so on this day in 1865, no.